speaking today with Dr. Lena Wen, emergency physician and professor of health policy and management at George Washington University's School of Public Health. She's a senior fellow uh, at the Brookings Institution and previously served as Baltimore's health commissioner. Dr. Wen is a medical analyst for CNN and a contributing columnist to the Washington Post. She's the author of many papers and several books, including When Doctors Don't Listen and her most recent Lifelines, a doctor's journey in the fight for public health. Dr. Wen, welcome back to Conversations on Healthcare. Thank you very much. It's great to be back. Thank you for the work that you both have been doing during the pandemic. Oh, that's great. You know, there were so many powerful quotes in the book, but the one that really grabbed me was, public health saved your life. You just don't know it. Uh, you know, and if the COVID-19 pandemic did anything, uh, it made the general public far more aware of the public health um, and how integral it is to uh, staying healthy and even alive. I wonder if you could just talk to our listeners about public health awareness. Uh, the pandemic has brought us through some of its successes and also some of the epic failures uh, as this public health crisis unfolded. Well, I believe I heard the quote, public health saved your life today, you just don't know it, from Dr. Karen DeSalvo, the former Assistant Secretary of Health and, at HHS. And it just really stuck with me because in a way that encapsulates all the problems that we have with getting people to pay attention to public health. The, by definition, public health is invisible. We have succeeded when we prevented something from happening. And so you don't see it. There is no face of public health. But as a result of being invisible, it often becomes the first item on the chopping block when it comes to budget time. And so we have seen that local public health, for example, local and state public health have lost something like 30% of their workforce in the last 20 years. That it is something that is chronically underfunded, underinvested, undervalued. It is not something that is reimbursed, right? We, when we talk to our patients, addressing the social determinants of health is not something that is reimbursed in the same way that a cardiac stent is going to be. And so it remains a major challenge um, well before the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic did not create the problems of health disparities. It didn't create the problems of underinvestment in public health. But I think to your point that the pandemic has really brought to light what happens when we do not invest in public health? What happens when we let these rampant disparities go? And I hope that coming out of this, the, I think the optimistic way perhaps of looking at this is that hopefully coming out of this, there's going to be renewed attention and impetus to addressing these issues. Dr. Wen, you don't mince words when talking about the pandemic. And we know that so many things were done wrong and it led to such enormous losses in our country. Maybe uh, for our learning, you can outline some of what you see as the more egregious missteps throughout the crisis. Uh, and even more recently, what were some of the important opportunities that we've missed? And maybe how these things illustrate the changes that you hope to see, not just in managing the pandemic, but really in our future approach to public health. That's right. I mean, we are certainly in a much better place. And I think it is fair to say that the worst is probably behind us, although the pandemic is certainly not over. In terms of the lessons learned, I think there are at least three key lessons. The first is the importance of having a national coordinated strategy. It did not make sense that in the beginning that states had to figure out how to procure their own PPE, their own testing. Um, it did not make sense that there were states right next to one another that had very different protocols when it came to the types of masking procedures, as an example, that were there. We are not an island, and it, doesn't, it just doesn't work. Public health doesn't work in isolation. So I think that's something that, that we have learned. Second thing that, that we've learned is the importance of communication, that when there are elected leaders who differ from the words of their public health officials, that that leads to confusion and it leads to erosion of public trust. Public health ultimately depends on that kind of public trust. And so when that trust is eroded, when the public is really confused about who to believe, it's really difficult to get that back. And also public health requires getting people to do things that they otherwise don't want to do. It's hard to get people to 
quarantine if exposed or wear a mask when we don't have a mask wearing culture. And so having that lack of trust was a substantial issue. The third thing that the pandemic has shown us is about the rampant disparities that, that we see. Again, COVID did not create disparities, but we've also seen that unless we are intentional about addressing disparities, that they're going to perpetuate. I mean, unless we were intentional, for example, about addressing vaccine equity and vaccine distribution, the problems were only going to get worse. And those who were um, who are privileged are going to have more resources. Those who are under-resourced are going to get fewer. So I think that's something else that we've learned. Now, coming out of this, I think there's an opportunity to address all of these aspects. And in some ways, the Biden administration has already done a lot of work. They've certainly done a lot of work to bolster the federal health infrastructure to get vaccines out, as we've talked about. They've really committed to health equity, which I commend them for. I never thought that we would see an administration that embeds health equity in every aspect of their work. Mm -hmm. But I think there's still a lot more to be done when it comes to rebuilding that public trust. And actually, I, I, if there's one criticism that I would have of the Biden administration, it's maybe not recognizing that public health is not just about the science. Of course, I believe, as I'm sure you and everybody listening believes in following the science, but you could have one set of data, but five different interpretations of it. Public health is also about values. And I actually thought it was a major problem when the CDC came out with their guidance that essentially led to the lifting of all indoor mask mandates because they, in that sense, they were saying that the values, the valuing freedom for some, the value of being able to be unvaccinated and unmasked is greater than the value of protecting the most vulnerable. Hmm. You know, Dr. Wen, I wanna pull the thread on the uh, conversation you just started on public trust and you become a very familiar face of the pandemic as a medical analyst at CNN. And one thing you talk about in your book and you just talked about here, uh, is, was the need for this honest, clear, understandable communication about the public health crisis. And, uh, you know, Pfizer uh, the other day uh, was talking about the need for a potential booster shot. Uh, we had Dr. Fauci on just a few weeks ago who thought maybe the vaccine uh, efficacy would be one to two years, but he noted, I really wanna see the data <laughs> before we make this. It becomes very confusing in the public's mind particularly some of the more elderly and vulnerable populations who were early on in December getting this, who are now gonna sort of say, well, Pfizer is saying this, but not with a lot of data. Just wondering if you could shed some light on the consensus or, or what, what we know about the, the need for a booster shot. Um, particularly, you know, obviously the Delta variant is uh, uh, making its way through the country. So uh, share with us your thoughts uh, about where we are uh, in terms of knowing whether or not uh, the population will, in a very short time, need to start queuing up for a booster shot. Yeah, I mean, if there's any question that I get asked the most probably from my vaccinated patients, it's this one of when is it that I'm going to need a booster, which is very interesting because while we have a third of the population that just is not getting vaccinated, there is probably another third that's saying the moment that I need a booster, I want to get that booster. Right. And so seeing that that kind of difference in reaction is, is very interesting. I think that what is happening um, in the public discourse is that we're seeing a lot of conversations play out in the public that normally would have occurred maybe even behind closed doors, hmm. but I don't mean in a secretive way. I just mean that people just didn't pay attention to it. But those were conversations that scientists normally would have with one another. And when, I mean, as clinicians, you definitely understand this, that we clinicians understand that there is nuance, that yes, there are some things that are clear, cl clear cut, black and white, there's a lot in medicine that exists in the gray area. And for example, when it comes to booster shots, we always thought that at some point, one of two things may happen. One, immunity might wane, or two, there might be variants that develop that evade the protection of the existing vaccines. Now, we also know as clinicians that probably if either of those things were to happen, it wouldn't be that one day you go from 90 some percent efficacy to 0% efficacy. Maybe it wanes as a 90% to 60% to 40%, I mean, something like that. 
That kind of nuance is difficult to explain. In the same way, it's difficult to be explaining that maybe there are some patients who may benefit from a booster even now. For example, patients with severe immunocompromise actually may benefit from a booster now. There was a study done that looked at patients with, um, who are, 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 um, are organ transplant recipients on immunosuppression. For those individuals, it might actually make sense for them to receive a third booster shot now. Hmm. Older individuals who received the vaccine earlier, it is important for us to get those data on when those individuals might need to get the vaccine. Or people who got the Johnson Johnson one dose vaccine, might there be less efficacy? And so if they choose to, might there be some patients who are particularly vulnerable to severe outcomes who should get a booster? Again, that's that exists in this gray zone of medicine where clinicians have to make nuanced decisions with our patients that when that's put into the public discourse, sometimes it's understood as all or nothing. And I actually think that we need to change our, just the way that we're looking at this and advising people. But one more thing to add on this, and again, I don't mean to sound like I'm down on the CDC. I think that they have done some really incredible work. One thing that um, has been problematic was the CDC's decision to stop tracking mild right. breakthrough infections. I think it's really important for us to understand asymptomatic and mild breakthrough infections. We need to know, first of all, do they still result in long COVID? Also, at what point are these breakthrough infections happening? If we know that after six months, suddenly we're seeing all these breakthrough infections that, that are mild, that's still important data and we should know. Or if we're seeing that Johnson Johnson, people who got that vaccine have more breakthroughs than Moderna or Pfizer, also important information. And so I think that right now, one of my concerns has been that in a way, it's a repeat of what we've seen at the beginning of the pandemic. Just because we're not testing for something doesn't mean it's not there. And in fact, I don't think that lack of data is a problem. We need more information and not less. Dr. Wen, in your book, you draw a line through your own story in the quest to improve public health. And you start talking about your early days in an immigrant family on food stamps, trying to get by and also trying to access health care and your days in the emergency room where you so often saw the non-medical issues that led to frequent hospitalizations. Of course, your work in Baltimore as the health commissioner on to Planned Parenthood, the pandemic. It's been quite a journey and so many lessons. Share, if you will, some of the most powerful lessons that inform the work that you're doing today. Here, I really want to commend the Biden team, um, Bashar Shakir, um, Vivek Murthy. Um, uh, so many people have done just incredible work in terms of spreading information um, and and really relying on trusted messengers. This is hard work, right? Let's make no mistake on this. This is the hard work of 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 being of 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 hitting the ground. I mean, this is you know this is the this is the ground game. This is not the in a way the mass vaccination sites were the low hanging fruit. There are people who were <laughs> if you build it they will come. Now it's answering people's questions. It is a go it's reaching people who may not have a primary care physician and and trying to get trusted messengers to talk to them about the importance of getting the vaccine, the seriousness of coronavirus, the safety of the vaccines, overcoming misinformation, that's hard. And by the way, I really think that the ground game at this point, are it's going to rely on primary care doctors and nurses and uh, pharmacists and nurse practitioners, physician assistants, people who are healthcare providers on the front lines and have the trust of their patients. That work is hard. I actually think that what the Biden team can help to in aid in this way is to reimburse for it, reimburse for the time of all these conversations that really take time. Um, and I think that could be an additional incentive to assist too. But I actually think there's one more thing that would help a lot and would really dramatically increase vaccine uptake. And that is to for, um, for more private entities, companies, universities, schools even, to start requiring vaccines. You could still have an opt out. You could say, if you don't want to be vaccinated, okay, sign this piece of paper and then go for twice weekly testing. If we did that, we would make vaccination the easy choice and make staying unvaccinated the hard choice. Right now, we have it backwards. Right now, it's just as easy to be unvaccinated. And so people who are on the fence are staying unvaccinated. We have to switch that around. And I think that would make a big difference. You know, we couldn't agree with you more. We've done that. Uh, certainly, we're a healthcare organization, but we've done it with all of our vendors as well. We think it's important uh, for everyone to, to be vaccinated. And I think the institutional players uh, will make a big difference. We're speaking today with Dr. Lino Wen, emergency 
uh, physician, uh, CNN medical analyst, and author of Lifelines, A Doctor's Journey in the Fight for Public Health. You know, Dr. Wen, in your book, you describe uh, public health as a discipline that straddles uh, the worlds of science, policy, medicine, and advocacy. Uh, and therein lies the challenge, right? Uh, there's often a lot of friction uh, at these points of intersection. I'm wondering how do we build a health system that's more efficiently integrated at these desperate uh, elements uh, as you uh, experienced at Planned Parenthood and during the pandemic, ideology can be a powerful adversary when seeking to do public health. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the inherent challenges and what do we do about it? Well, two things that I want to mention here. One is I want to quote a friend and colleague, Dr. Boris Lushniak, who often says that the work that we do, and I'm kind of I'm paraphrasing what, what he says now, but the work that we do in public health and health policy is political, but not partisan. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that everybody should have this idea or have this, this share this value. Certainly there are clinicians who also run for office and are very involved in partisan politics and hats off to, to them. We certainly need more representation. Um, so this is not a criticism, but rather to say that my own philosophy aligns with what Boris says, which is that there's a way to be political, understanding of politics and policies, understanding that public health also, you need to navigate the political system, you have to navigate public policies, but that you don't need to be partisan. And certainly I'm very, I'm very careful to stay away from partisan ideology um, and to stay away from, um, from being labeled a, a member of any political party. I just don't think that it helps with our work, which actually is about striving for common ground, or as my longtime mentor, Dr. Or, um, uh, the, the late Congressman Elijah Cummings would say, this is about not just striving for common ground, but higher ground. I think you don't get there by digging into your entrenched um, in, into your entrenched ideology, but rather looking for common ground that everyone can start from, ideally the higher ground that, that, we, that we can all be taken to. And then there's another element that public health is by definition also very local. And actually on the local level, there isn't a lot of partisanship. I mean, whether you are um, getting your house um, remediated for lead or getting your restaurant inspected for food poisoning, um, that's not a partisan issue. And I think the more that we can really focus in public health about delivering services to people, delivering value to people in their lives and making a difference to their everyday lives, the more that we can actually focus on getting the work done and not be caught up in ideological battles. Dr. Wen, we need more resources for public health, of course, but it's also very helpful to have inspiration. Uh, and this is an area where we, we don't have a short supply. Uh, you know a few of the mentors who inspired you, uh, Dr. Jack Geiger, Fitzhugh Mullen, uh, even patient advocate Regina Holliday, whose painted jackets have become something of a walking gallery of stories of inspiration from patient activists. Give us some stories about those that have inspired you uh, and how we weave their narratives, not just into improving the infrastructure, but really how we train and inspire that next generation of healthcare providers and public health advocates. Hmm. Well, I think in threes, and so I'm gonna give you three, um, three things that came to mind as, as you were naming some of these people who were very influential in, in my life and, and in yours. Um, one is, because I came from a, a humble start, my parents and I were immigrants, we, we came to the US with less than $40 to our name, um, as I was writing about in, in, in Lifelines. I mean, I, you know, I didn't know that I could become a doctor. I had this dream and was really terrified of even sharing this dream with anyone because I thought who was going to believe me that I could do this. And I was very fortunate to have mentors who believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And so I think that all of us recognizing that we are an inspiration to someone, we may not know who that someone is, but there's someone out there who is looking up to us and is depending on um, us and what we say will have a big impact on the course of their lives, I think is, is one thing that, that really stays with me. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is Congressman Elijah Cummings, the late um, congressman from Baltimore, used to talk about pain, passion, and purpose. Mm -hmm. That for him, and I know for me too, that it's the pain that is the guide for our passion that then becomes our purpose. And whatever, um, whatever bad events that may have occurred in our lives that were extremely painful and challenging as a country, as a world, that there's a way for us to move forward 
and channel that pain into our passion that is our purpose. And I said the third thing that I learned from my, my mentors and I hope is an inspiration moving forward is to not wait. That there are so many things that sometimes in public health you can be caught in this paralysis of sorts because public health is about everything. And so where do you even begin? But just as we as clinicians, if a patient came to us and had many medical issues, it's never an option to say, well, let somebody else deal with it. Or it's just too many things, so let's, let's, let's not do any of it. It's not an option. We always have to start somewhere. And so don't wait, take action now. Um, I think is something else that I've taken away from all these really inspiring advocates in my life. Well, and you are an inspiration to us, uh, your story. This is such a compelling book. Um, it really walks through things that I, we had never known about you in terms of your journey, your family's journey here. And I think what's so powerful about it is you were able to translate that experience into action, uh, certainly becoming a physician, but the work that you did in Baltimore was, was so important. And really, as we try to improve our national and our global health infrastructure, things build up from the bottom, right? They start at local levels, and you did such incredible work on the opioid issue, but you also talked about uh, the improvement of uh, health services starts with our children, and you talked about school-based health centers, uh, which are near and dear to our heart. I forget how many you ended up setting up, 120 or more. Uh, talk a about why that model is so powerful and so important at this moment in, the, in this crisis is we're starting to see young people experiencing behavioral health issues uh, in, in significant numbers. And uh, we need these building blocks put in uh, place uh, locally for the national health system. And then certainly uh, you've been addressing the international role that America needs to play. Yeah, so when I was the health commissioner in Baltimore, we had health suites in all of our 180 or so public schools mm -hmm. and school-based centers in, I believe, 13 of our schools um, that had a comprehensive model. And actually, I was hoping that we could expand it even more, as in I thought the school-based health center could be the, the uh, primary care medical home, not only for the child, but ideally for the family. I mean, how amazing of a model would that be? Um, but I think to your point, it is something that, and I know you have done a lot of work with, with this too, and so would agree that for so many of our children, this is where they access healthcare. I mean, it, you know, we, I work and I live now in Baltimore. I don't work and live in Bethesda, right? I mean, it's just a very different environment of maybe in, in other places, there is more privilege and more opportunity, not for everyone, but for the majority, it's just a very different kind of environment where so many of our children, if it were not for the services that we provide in our schools, if it were not for our meals, if it were not for our healthcare, that they might go without. Um, and also, why should kids have to leave school in order to seek services that actually can be done there? Why should kids have to miss school and parents have to miss work to take them to see the doctor for asthma, which is bread and butter that can be done right in their schools? Or we set up a program for glasses for every child based on a similar model. There, We found out that we just lost a lot of kids between the time they got their vision screened to being identified as needing glasses. But that doesn't have to happen. We can remove those barriers and get glasses to every child who needs them right in their schools without having the barrier of insurance and all these other things that actually sometimes get in the way of actually our patients, our, our students, getting the care that, that they need. Mental health, you mentioned, um, such a neglected area. I mean, we as a society, do not treat mental health the same way that we regard physical health. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's long past time for us to do so. But I think that's something else that um, when I was the health commissioner, we also did a lot when it came to improving mental health and trauma services in our city. And I detailed actually one of the reason, not even one of the reasons, but the reason I wanted to write the book was how do we decide what issues to focus on? Of all the public health issues there are, how do we decide to focus on these? And what specifically did we do? So much of the time, I, I feel like I read about programs that happened and I read about the outcomes, which is great and really important, but what were the struggles that you went through? What programs did you reject on the pro in the process of trying to figure out these ones? Um, what were the, how, did, how, how were they successful? What were the, the decision points along the way? Um, and so I hope that, that um, the, uh, explaining why we chose to focus on schools and mental health, for example, would also be important parts of the conversation. We've been speaking today with Dr. Lena Wen, 
medical analyst for CNN, and author of Lifelines, A Doctor's Journey in the Fight for Public Health. Learn more about her work by going to drlenawen.com or follow her on Twitter at Dr. Lena Wen. Dr. Wen, we want to thank you for your persistent quest to improve the public health in this country, for providing a clear voice to the public during the pandemic, and for joining us once again on Conversations on Healthcare. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join you, and I want to thank you and everyone watching and listening for the incredible work that you have done over the last year and a half and just in general. So thank you.